welcome everybody. I want to uh, thank you for taking time to join us this evening for our webinar on safe and superior glaucoma technology with corneal hysteresis. We have two outstanding presenters tonight, Felipe Medeiros and Devinder Grover, and we will uh, get this thing wrapped up in, in, in an hour so that you can all get on with your evening. Um, just a few uh, welcome and housekeeping items. First of all, what we're gonna talk about tonight largely is a changing landscape of tonometry and glaucoma. You know, there's uh, increasing concerns as the years have gone on over Goldman tonometry accuracy, things like biomechanics and tear film and corneal thickness that affect that, that device and also inter and interoperator uh, variability. We know that there's a need for more and better information because glaucoma is a multifactorial condition that's difficult to predict. Uh, we know now that there's a need for greater efficiency and the ability to delegate tests. And of course, uh, COVID has changed everything and we need to talk about safety of all tests, including tonometry and, and other devices. Just a few housekeeping items before we get uh, started here. There are some handouts uh, on the GoToWebinar panel, probably over on the right-hand side of your screen. There's a number of documents there that you can download, some PDFs and things that are hopefully useful for you. Uh, our, our method of uh, questions, our, pre our preference is that you type them in. There's a question panel um, that makes it a little bit more manageable than uh, opening up the, the microphones to the audience, so to speak. So appreciate it if you'd use that method of asking questions and then I can, I can uh, delegate the question to the correct panelist. Um, there's a couple audience polls, I think about four or five of them during the presentation that makes it fun and interesting. So at various portions of the presentation, I'll launch a poll and that gives you the audience the opportunity to um, uh, vote. And then we you know, find out what the audience is thinking about these various things. And then at the end of the webinar, please take one minute to take our survey. Let us know what you liked, what you disliked. That helps us to do a better job next time. Um, Two great speakers, as I mentioned, Felipe Medeiros, MD, PhD. He's a professor of ophthalmology and the director of clinical research at Duke University. Uh, he has over 300 peer-reviewed publications and at least six books in ophthalmology with over 16,000 citations, chair of the American Glaucoma Society Program Committee, tons of research for the uh, past couple of decades focused on development of innovative methods and technologies for the early diagnosis, detection, um, and management of glaucoma. Uh, he's going to be speaking tonight about the importance of the ocular response analyzer and glaucoma risk assessment with emphasis on the corneal hysteresis parameter in a review of the published evidence. Devinder Grover is also with us this evening. He is a fellowship trained glaucoma specialist who specializes in complex medical and surgical management of uh, glaucoma and cataracts. He has developed novel surgical techniques, works with a variety of different companies in the industry to develop and design instruments. And he's authored numerous peer-reviewed publications, several book chapters, and serves as a reviewer for many of the peer-reviewed journals. He is also on the AGS Board of Directors. He's going to be speaking to us tonight about use of the ocular response analyzer in clinical practice, present a series of case studies that are very interesting and compelling, and talk about safety uh, in the COVID era. My name is Dave Taylor. I've been with Reichert for about 20 years. Believe it or not, 18 years I've been involved with this ocular response analyzer product. So this is not something new that we're gonna talk about here this evening. Um, so uh, let's get going. I'm gonna just do a brief introduction to the technology and then turn things over to the professionals here. I guess the first uh, poll that we have the opportunity to do is to ask the audience, how familiar are you with corneal hysteresis? So I'm gonna launch this poll and everybody just go ahead and, and, uh, and vote uh, how familiar you are with corneal hysteresis. pretty evenly split here so far, but, but the majority say, I've heard of it, but I'm just not sure how to use it clinically. Um, yeah, over 50% say I've heard of it, but I don't know how to use it clinically. So you're gonna learn how to use it clinically tonight between the evidence and the literature that Dr. Medeiros is gonna present and the wonderful cases that Dr. Grover is gonna present. I think you're gonna, I think you're gonna have an answer to that question by the end of this presentation. You know, I'm a car guy, and so I like to compare everything to cars, and I think everybody's been in a car before, and you know what it's like to bounce up and down in a car. And um, you may or may not know that underneath the car, you've got suspension, and that suspension is primarily made up of springs and dampers or shock absorbers. And this is really analogous to, to what's going on in the human eye. Um, it, it, the eye has uh, uh, both elastic and viscous properties, 
And um, those properties affect things like tonometry uh, and the biomechanics of the, the cornea and the globe. Uh, if you look at this little model here, you'll see two car wheels rolling over an elliptical surface, and the one on the right is bouncing up and down uncontrollably. And the reason that is because it's got a bad shock absorber. The springs are the same, the control arms, everything is the same in this setup except for the shock absorber is bad on the right-hand side. So when you have a bad shock absorber, that shock absorber cannot stop the energy from causing that wheel uh, from hopping up and down. And that gives you a, a rough ride and, and it probably will be very uncomfortable for passengers in that vehicle and may damage other parts of the vehicle due to the abuse. So really it's quite similar. Uh, in the human eye, you know, you've got interocular pressure in the front, you've got intracranial pressure in the back, and in the middle, you've got the ocular pulse pounding away on these structures 24-7. I once heard a speaker at a, at a presentation say the eye is under a constant assault, and that really resonated with me. I thought that really, really talked, uh, really got to what we're talking about here when we talk about the biomechanics of the eye and how perhaps that plays a role in glaucoma. Uh, the question is, can the eye deal with all of this uh, shock that it's under all the time? And can we measure that shock absorber capacity of the eye? And that's really what the corneal hysteresis measurement does. Hysteresis is not something Reichert invented. In fact, in fact it, it, matter of fact, it's been around, the term has been around since 1890. Hysteresis is a term that characterizes response to application and removal of force where materials do not instantly follow an applied force but react slowly or dissipate a portion of the applied energy, just like in the shock absorber example we looked at on the last slide. And if you go up on PubMed, you'll find over 7,500 publications that uh, have the word hysteresis in them and it's been studied in a variety of fields, uh, tissues, tendons, lungs, heart, you name it. David Luce, who unfortunately passed away in 2017, was the pioneer of corneal hysteresis, which is a parameter that reflects the ability of the cornea to absorb and dissipate energy. Currently, it's only measurable by the Reichert Ocular Response Analyzer. Um, and this is, again, a, an indication of viscoelastic damping or how good of a shock absorber are the tissues of the eye. How does it work? Well, there's a little animation. We shine a beam of infrared light on the cornea and the reflected light is monitored by a photodetector. An air pulse causes the cornea to move inward. When the cornea reaches an applinated state, the maximum amount of reflected infrared light enters the detector and we get a signal peak. After that, the cornea becomes slightly indented for a few milliseconds, which causes the air pulse to reduce in velocity, and the cornea then comes back to its original shape of curvature on the way it passes through a second applination. So we refer to this as a bidirectional applination. The cornea goes in and comes back out and passes through an inward and an outward applination during that 25 millisecond journey. The instrument produces a signal that looks like this. And just briefly, the green curve there is the force applied by the air jet. So it's a load and unload of force on the cornea. And the red curve there is the optical signal that comes from the eye, which describes or characterizes the motion of the cornea. Those two peaks that you see there are the optical signal peaks that correspond to the inward and the outward applination events. And the difference between those pressure measurements is the corneal hysteresis. If the cornea were a spring only, and you compress that spring halfway and then back again, there would be no hysteresis. But because the cornea is viscoelastic, it absorbs a portion of the supplied energy resulting in this hysteresis phenomenon, which we measure with this technology. Um, we also can measure something we call IOPCC, which stands for corneal compensated intraocular pressure. Because this process gives us information about corneal biomechanics, we quantify those properties and we are able to reduce their impact on the IOP measurement. So we produce a Goldman correlated pressure measurement that is less affected by things like central corneal thickness, corneal biomechanics, and refractive surgery. So the IOP measurement uh, that we produce with this device is, uh, we believe, a more accurate pressure measurement, less affected by known contamination uh, variables, and uh, we'll present some evidence of that this evening. This is what the screen looks like on the instrument. Very briefly, at the bottom, you have something we call the waveform score, which is similar to your signal score on an OCT. Is it a good measurement or not? 
We have a Goldman correlated interocular pressure measurement for a frame of reference, but the one I just mentioned there, the IOPCC, is at the top of the window. And then in the middle, the all important corneal hysteresis measurement that Dr. Medeiros and Dr. Grover will spend a good deal of time talking about here this evening. Just so that you are aware, the units are millimeters of mercury, an average value is about 10.5, and a typical range in a normal population is about 8 to 14. Low corneal hysteresis is a risk factor for glaucoma. High hysteresis is a good thing, just for, so you have a frame of reference when we start throwing around numbers here later in the presentation. That's enough out of me. I'm going to turn things over to Felipe Medeiros here, um, and he is going to talk about uh, his perspective on how corneal hysteresis can help stratifying glaucoma risk. Dr. Medeiros, over to you. Okay. Um, well, good evening, everyone, and um, thanks, Dave. And it's a it's a pleasure to um, be speaking to you guys. And um, these are my uh, financial disclosures. I have been a consultant uh, for uh, Rikert, and I have also received uh, research support from a number of industry members. Uh, next, please. So we're going to be talking about the evidence that has been accumulated with regard to the role of corneal hysteresis in, um, as a risk factor uh, in predicting glaucoma development and also progression of the disease. And it's quite amazing to see uh, the increase in the number of publications over the years with regard to corneal hysteresis. I think at this point, we have really very good, very strong evidence uh, on, on, on the role of corneal hysteresis for glaucoma development and, and progression. So as Dave mentioned, uh, a normal value of corneal hysteresis, and this has been demonstrated through a number of uh, uh, studies in many different parts of the world. The normal value is of about 10, 10.5 uh, millimeters of mercury with a standard deviation that is about 1.5. There is some relationship between corneal hysteresis and age, but it's a, mostly a weak relationship. Corneal hysteresis tends to decrease uh, slightly with age. But uh, most importantly, um, when you look at corneal hysteresis variation throughout, let's say, the 24-hour period, uh, it's quite different than what happens to pressure, for example. We know pressure varies a lot through the 24-hour period, but uh, sleep lab studies actually show that corneal hysteresis remains essentially the same throughout the 24-hour period. So, um, next slide. <clears throat> uh, it's been uh, almost uh, 15 years since the first study that showed the role of corneal hysteresis as a predictor of glaucoma progression. That study was published by Nathan Cogden, and uh, uh, Davinder actually participated in that study. And it was a retrospective study where they looked at, uh, they performed a, a, a medical chart review, and they looked at patients with glaucoma or suspect of glaucoma. Uh, and to see those who had progressed or not, they collected uh, corneal hysteresis on those people and looked to see if hysteresis was associated with progression. And they found that hysteresis, a low corneal hysteresis, was associated with progressive field worsening. So that was back in 2006, uh, that study. Um, a subsequent publication by uh, Carlos uh, Gus de Moraes that was in um, from the New York group. And, and Gus, he actually showed how corneal hysteresis was associated with uh, rates of visual field loss over time. So eyes that had low corneal hysteresis had uh, 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 faster rates of change. So you can see in this table here that they looked at many variables, age, gender, uh, race, uh, peak pressure, mean pressure, and so on, including corneal thickness. But the interesting thing here is that when they looked at the combined effect of these variables, 
in a multivariable model, you can see that only age, pressure, and corneal hysteresis remained significant. Um, this again was a retrospective study, so meaning that uh, they collected the corneal hysteresis uh, after the determination of whether the patients had progression or not. So they looked back in the chart to see if there was evidence of progression. So of course, when you there, there are limitations to that kind of study because you don't really know if corneal hysteresis was a cause or an effect. So uh, based on that, in uh, we set up actually a prospective study where we collected corneal hysteresis at the very beginning of follow-up, and then we followed subjects over time uh, to see those who progressed and who did not progress. So uh, this was a study that we followed uh, over 114 eyes of patients with glaucoma. Uh, next. And what we saw in this study is that if you actually divide the patients based on those with corneal histories is less than 10 or greater than 10, which is about the average as, as we discussed, you can see that the group with uh, corneal histories is lower than 10, you pretty much don't see, um, I'm sorry, in the, in the group that had corneal histories is lower than 10, you see the slopes going down uh, quite significant. You see the blue lines or the slopes, and you see lots of people with really very fast progression. And in the a group of corneal histories is greater than 10 on your right, then you see that the slope was mostly flat. And importantly, in this sample, there were no rapid progressors in the group with corneal histories greater than 10. So without that uh, corneal hysteresis was associated with uh, uh, rates of uh, uh, decline in the visual field. And an interesting finding uh, was a comparison uh, between corneal hysteresis and corneal thickness. So some people uh, asked the question, well, is corneal hysteresis just providing you the same information as corneal thickness? Why do I need to do hysteresis and can't I just look at corneal thickness? Uh, and uh, what we found was that corneal hysteresis was about three times more strongly associated with the rate of visual field progression than corneal thickness. So again, corneal hysteresis explained a lot more of the progression in the sample compared to corneal thickness. And another very interesting finding was the interaction between pressure and hysteresis. So this is illustrated in, in this colored plot that you see there. And what this plot shows, uh, this is a, what's called a surface plot. And what, what it actually shows you is each line there has the rates of change. So you have zero, the green, which means no progression. And then you have progressively worse rates, yellow and, and red, uh, like minus 1% per year, 2% uh, per year, and so on. And what this plot shows is that people who had high pressure and low hysteresis were particularly bad. So they really progressed very fast. People who had low pressures and also uh, larger values for corneal hysteresis, they, bear, they didn't really progress. But the interesting thing also is that you some people had pressures that were relatively high, but because they had uh, a, a, a large values for corneal hysteresis, they didn't progress that much. So this means how important it is to take into account these two variables when you're assessing patient risk. Next. So this previous study looked only at people who had glaucoma diagnosed at baseline. So everyone had a diagnosis of glaucoma at baseline. But another interesting question is, is corneal hysteresis a predictive factor for uh, the development of glaucoma in those who are suspect of the disease? And um, in this other study, which we published just a couple of years ago, 
we looked at people who were suspected of having glaucoma, so mostly ocular hypertensive patients. And um, as you can see on those curves, um, these, are, these represent the cumulative uh, probability of developing glaucoma. You can see that the eyes that had lower uh, hysteresis, so the black uh, curve on top, they had a higher chance of developing glaucoma over time. And the eyes that had higher than average hysteresis then had a lower chance of, uh, of uh, uh, converting to glaucoma. And the average in this sample was 10.2, which we is in line with we, what we know. So <clears throat> again, in this cohort of suspects, corneal hysteresis was independently predictive of conversion to glaucoma, even when we actually put in the model age, intraocular pressure, as well as corneal thickness. So uh, uh, important point here is that corneal hysteresis, again, it provided additional information compared to what is provided by uh, uh, corneal thickness only. Next. So an interesting group of patients uh, that we see in clinical practice uh, are those who have pressures that appear to be very well controlled, but they still get worse, okay? We see these patients uh, uh, in clinic and we wanted to see, well, what are the risk factors for progression in those people? So we set up this study. We looked at only at people who had pressures no higher than 15 during follow-up, okay? And as you can see in this table, their mean pressure was actually about 12, 12 millimeters of mercury. So these are people with clearly low pressures at follow-up, but interestingly, about a quarter of them, despite having those relatively low pressures, they still progressed. And again, this is in line with what we see in practice. We see that actually, despite lowering the pressure, you still get some people to, to progress. And then we, uh, well, what are the risk factors that, uh, of, of, that explain that progression? And among the variables that we were able to examine, uh, corneal hysteresis was uh, uh, clearly different in the two groups. So the group that pro progressed over time had lower hysteresis measurements than the group that did not progress. So again, if you have a patient uh, who has a low hysteresis, you have to be alert that even uh, uh, with pressures that are relatively low, that patient might still be at a higher risk for progression, meaning that he may even need pressures that are even lower than what you you had at this at that point. So. Um, why is corneal hysteresis associated with risk of progression? And this is a, another very interesting question. And uh, as Dave mentioned, hysteresis is related to the viscoelastic properties of the cornea. And those properties are determined by the extracellular matrix components. So there's a speculation that they could also be related to the uh, properties the viscoelastic properties, biomechanical properties of the tissues in the posterior region of the eye. And one of the first studies to investigate this was by Tony Wells from New Zealand. And uh, what Tony and colleagues, they did is they, um, they artificially elevated pressure using a suction ring and they performed uh, the old HRT imaging on um, before and after pressure elevation. And they look at the changes in the cup and they show that those changes in the cup could be uh, explained were correlated with the corneal hysteresis, meaning that that compliance of the tissues seems to be dependent on the corneal hysteresis. Next, a more recent work actually used uh, spectral domain OCT to look at that. So they perform, uh, uh, they obtain scans before and after medical treatment in patients with uh, uh, glaucoma or ocular hypertension. And they found a significant relationship that you can see in this scatter plot between corneal hysteresis and the lamina displacement. 
So uh, greater lamina displacement was seen in eyes that had larger values of hysteresis. So what, what does it mean? So uh, the explanation was that uh, eyes with low hysteresis may actually uh, have a stiffening of the peripapillary sclera. So these eyes with low hysteresis may have a reduced uh, capacity of uh, uh, dampening the effect of pressure, let's say pressure variations or pressure fluctuations. And this would potentially increase the strain in the lamina cribrosa and lead to greater uh, uh, glaucomatous damage. So all this evidence uh, points to uh, corneal hysteresis being a risk factor uh, from the development and also uh, uh, in patients who already have glaucomatous damage. So it seems that corneal hysteresis may be a surrogate for those biomechanical properties of the uh, optic nerve head and, and surrounding structures so that it would then be an indication, a way that we can obtain indication of the susceptibility of the optic nerve to glaucomatous damage. So uh, uh, one last thing I would like to talk about uh, is the IOPCC. And IOPCC was mentioned by Dave and uh, uh, we published a paper about 15 years ago on IOPCC and its relationship with uh, corneal biomechanical properties. And at that time, we saw that IOPCC had pretty much no relationship with corneal uh, thickness as it's meant to be. It's, a, it's, a, it's an IOP parameter that is meant to correct for those corneal uh, biomechanical properties. And but uh, as expected, the Goldman tonometry was uh, 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 related to the corneal thickness measurement. So if you have thick corneas, you know you're going to get an overestimated pressure measurement. But I think more important than, than this and more important than studies that attempt to look where the, the pressure that is obtained by a tonometer is related to the monometric pressure inside the eye that is obtaining the OR under very specific circumstances. I think all of this mounts the evidence, but really the important thing is to see if the pressure that we're getting is predictive of clinically relevant outcomes. Theoretically, the pressure number doesn't really matter uh, from a patient standpoint, what really matters is that that patient's going to get worse or not, is going to develop visual function loss or not. So the most, in, uh, uh, the best way to demonstrate whether a certain pressure measurement is effective or not in managing glaucoma is to show that it's related to uh, changes in the clinically relevant outcome, let's say the rates of visual field loss. So uh, in this study that we published just recently, that's exactly what we did was to look at, to compare different uh, methods of pressure measurement, Goldman, eye care, and IOPCC, and to see which one was more strongly related to rates of visual field progression over time. Again, that's the reason why we take pressures. It's because we believe that a higher pressure means a higher risk of getting worse on the visual field. And what we found was that uh, IOPCC was over two times more strongly associated with rates of visual field loss and more than four times than the eye care. So, uh, so IOPCC was uh, 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 the best measurement in explaining those rates of visual field progression over time. So the results of this study, as well as uh, 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 a similar study that was conducted uh, as part of the um, uh, United Kingdom Glaucoma Treatment Study that was presented at ARVO. Uh, they showed the potential of uh, IOPCC and how it's related to clinically relevant outcomes. And this has led to a publication of a recent editorial by Gus uh, Gazzard and uh, David Friedman, where they question whether it's time to move on from Goldman tonometry. 
we've been doing gold mantonometry for 70 years and it has not really evolved at all. We, we know that it's full of artifacts. We get a sense, a false sense of security because you get that little number when you rotate the dial. But again, how strongly is Goldman actually related to the clinically relevant outcomes that we have to, that are really important for the patient? So, and what they claim uh, in the editorial is, uh, well, why are we persisting in using the GAT clinically? Uh, they 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 go over the fact that the t the test is is relatively time consuming. Uh, the reproducibility is actually not that great. Uh, it slows down clinic, and it just again gives a false sense of security to the to the uh, um, clinician. And they claim that the ocular response analyzer is clearly a better alternative that would provide more information about who is getting worse. So very interesting editorial that I would recommend everyone uh, to read. So in conclusion, I think the evidence that has accumulated from many different groups uh, and from many different uh, 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 institutions throughout the world has pointed to corneal hysteresis being consistently a risk factor for development and progression of glaucoma. And a corneal hysteresis, again, may provide the surrogate indication of the susceptibility of the optic nerve head to damage. This is a strong hypothesis, but that new, still needs further uh, 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 studies. Uh, and finally, IOPCC has been shown to be more valuable than rebound tonometry or Goldman in predicting uh, what really matters, which are the clinically relevant outcomes in glaucoma as measured by uh, visual function. Thank you very much. Dr. Madero, thank you. That was a really uh, succinct and brief overview of an awful lot of, uh, of literature. We got a bunch of questions that came in while you were talking and we won't be able to answer them all, but we will follow up um, via email with the, with everybody yeah, for any unanswered questions. But I will I will answer one of them and I'll direct a couple of them to you, Dr. Medeiros. Um, one of them um, is from Dr. Mullen. Dr. Mullen asked, what's the relationship between IOPCC and IOPG with varying corneal hysteresis? I, I can answer that. Um, IOPCC is basically a hysteresis adjusted pressure measurement. That's not 100% technically true, but it's good enough for purposes of this discussion. If you have an average hysteresis of 10 or 10.5, your IOPG and your IOPCC should match. If you have low hysteresis, the IOPCC will be higher than the IOPG, which would indicate that a Goldman is gonna understate your pressure. And if you have high corneal hysteresis, the IOPCC will be lower than the IOPG, which would indicate that a Goldman is going to overestimate your pressure. Um, Dr. Yusefi asks you, Felipe, in your study um, that showed the, the lines, the blue lines of progression, and, and on, the, uh, on the high hysteresis side, we saw very few progressors, if any, and on the low hysteresis side, we saw many progressors. He noted that on the high hysteresis side, there were a couple of patients who seem to have positive visual field index slopes over time and wonders if that's contaminating the, the average results of the study or not. Okay, so that, that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, and positive slopes, they can happen from uh, learning effects, some learning effects, and just from variability. So that's an unavoidable thing. And some on a sample that you get, a representative sample, it would be weird if we didn't have any of those, actually, because it's just part of uh, uh, the distribution when you have that sample, you expect some of the positive slopes. Uh, but the chance of having those positive slopes was really pretty much the same in two groups. Um, uh, we didn't really see any difference between the two groups on that. So it's not that it was, uh, 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 again, uh, driving the mean or being an outlier to driving the mean. I think that's what you're asking. Um, and and uh, somebody asks, Dr. <clears throat> Medeiros, do you expect uh, corneal parameters like hysteresis to change with treatment, particularly prostaglandins? Right, yeah. That's that's an interesting question. Uh, some 
some investigators have described the small changes in corneal thickness uh, and some small changes with corneal hysteresis on treatment, but I don't think they are uh, 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 particularly clinically relevant. I mean, it's not that uh, the treatment with uh, 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 the PGA will uh, substantially change your corneal hysteresis to move you from a different category of risk that is attributed to that. Dr. Renaud asks, what is the general relationship between corneal thickness and corneal hysteresis? There is a relationship. So corneal hysteresis is related to, 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 to corneal thickness, as you would expect. So corneal hysteresis incorporates, again, it's a measure of that viscoelastic dampening. So that is influenced by also the thickness of the tissue. It's just that corneal thickness does not capture the whole picture of the, the biomechanical properties. But if you actually plot and if you look at the relationship between hysteresis and thickness, yes, they are correlated, but uh, certainly not to a very strong level. So there's a lot more in, uh, 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 information there that is not explained by that correlation. Yeah, and I think if you look at some of the studies that have been done on, on eyes with pathology, um, the, the correlation between hysteresis and thickness is nonlinear especially when you have patients with things like corneal edema and Fuchs dystrophy, those are thick corneas that are very soft, shall we say. Um, we have one more question here from Dr. Baugh that asks, uh, why is high IOP inversely related to corneal hysteresis? Um, I, I'll field this one uh, because there's a bit of it that's a machine artifact. If you're talking very high IOP, like pressures of 30 and above, there's a little bit of machine artifact in the way that we measure corneal hysteresis that relates to the strength of the air pulse. Basically, we would not want to indent a high IOPI to the same magnitude that we would a low IOPI because it would require a very, very large uh, air jet force. And we just simply don't do that. So when you start getting pressures of, of you know, 30 and above, the hysteresis gets reported as a lower value than it probably really is. So that may be part of what you're uh, observing or asking about there, Dr. Bob. Uh, and somebody asked, Dr. Vess asked, could we share the editorial Dr. Medeiros referenced, the British Journal of Ophthalmology editorial? Uh, we will uh, follow up uh, with everybody on this call with a reference of how to obtain that editorial. Uh, a lot of questions here. We can't get to all of them. I'm going to uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Medeiros, for that great presentation. I'll put you back on mute for the time being. Hopefully you can hang out with us for a little while longer, but I would understand if you had to, to go. And I'm gonna turn things over to uh, Dr. Grover at this point. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, you know, it's always a, Felipe is always a hard act to follow. I, I think before I start, I do think it's important to, to acknowledge the, the leadership he's shown. Uh, you know, there have been a ton of papers and research studies on hysteresis and glaucoma, but no one ever really took the time, the dedication, and had the intellect uh, and capabilities that, that Felipe had to, uh, to show without doubt in a prospective fashion some of the papers that he did. So he's really made a tremendous contribution to the field, this and uh, many other ways. Um, in, in demonstrating the connection between hysteresis and glaucoma development, hysteresis and glaucoma progression, as well as IOP measurement. Uh, so I thank Felipe for that. And every time I hear him speak, I learn I learn so much still. So uh, what I'm gonna talk, talk more about is more of some of the practical uses of what it's like in clinic. These are my financial disclosures. Uh, a pertinent is I am a, cons a consultant uh, for, for Riker and a speaker, uh, obviously, but these are my own thoughts and my own ideas. My other disclosure, my personal disclosure, is that uh, before OATS and uh, before hysteresis, I just thought the cornea was just an important window into that allowed me to see important things, and uh, we'll see if that still remains true after this talk. I'm going to really kind of go on, you know, um, Felipe did such a good job on, on talking about the evidence. I'm going to focus more on just how I use it, uh, case examples, and uh, and then talk on what's ever present in all of our minds and our lives is um, is tonometry in the setting of COVID. Uh, so, uh, you know, how do I use it in clinic? Um, it's, it's located kind of towards the front after the patients come in. Uh, we have one in every one of our locations, um, and, and I like it before every one of my, uh, you know, uh, 
before seeing every one of my patients, but uh, logistically that can sometimes be hard unless you have this instrument, uh, more than one of these instruments. So um, if you, you know, there are some of my colleagues that have said, hey, I don't need to buy fluorescein. Um, I don't need to train my technicians on Goldman apination. I can just do this. Sure, sign me up. And so a lot of my colleagues have just shifted entirely away from Goldman and as based on the you know the data that you should read from that editorial um, in the BJO by Ed, David Friedman and his colleagues um, but uh, but I still think you know I don't think this is a binary thing I don't think it's mutually exclusive I still think you use both um, but I really depend on it um, you know, I train my operators, my technicians to do it. I don't do it myself unless there's a problem, uh, but my technicians do it and it's very safe and easy for them to learn and, and to do. Uh, I do it on all new patients. I do it anytime I'm making a clinical decision or changing a clinical uh, clinical course. Um, and, and typically in patients with low hysteresis, what's also interesting is there is consistently a discrepancy between Goldman apination and IOPCC. Invariably, Goldman is reading lower than the IOPCC. So my patients with low hysteresis, I get them invariably um, all the time, or there's low tension glaucoma group. I think that's also, uh, this is hysteresis and IOPCC is giving us more insight into low tension glaucoma, as well as post-LASIK. So post-LASIK patients, I think the IOPCC is shown to be much more, a more accurate reflection of the true pressure. The hysteresis numbers sometimes fall off, so I don't do it, put a lot of weight in my post-LASIK patients on what their actual hysteresis number shows. I would put weight if I had a pre-LASIK hysteresis number, uh, but I do depend on the IOPCC. Uh, I still do both. Um, like I said, um, I, I still do Goldman apination, but um, but I lean a lot more towards uh, the IOPCC and hysteresis. Now, this is a study done by one of my uh, friends and colleagues, Nate Radcliffe, um, really showing that um, you know, and this is not a, uh, an expla explanation. This is more an observation, an association. For some reason, um, we're seeing that in patients with a lower hysteresis, they're having a greater response to prostaglandin analogs and latanoprost, uh, which is which is interesting and actually in some ways good because the, the, those are the patients with a low hysteresis that are at higher risk of glaucoma development and progression. Those are the ones you want the biggest bang for your buck. But that relationship is not true uh, with corneal thickness, just with hysteresis. So to echo what Felipe said earlier, you know, I think uh, they're talking about the same thing. But when I think of the difference between hysteresis and corneal thickness. I think corneal thickness is a poor man's hysteresis. I think hysteresis is a much more sophisticated way to evaluate the biomechanics of the eye. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is actually a case courtesy of, of Dr. Medeiros, um, part of the Diggs cohort um, and uh, some of the papers that he, uh, that he published on. Uh, this is a patient being followed regularly with consistent testing by a glaucoma specialist. That's very, very good. And despite that, you know, we've all seen these. Patients are still progressing despite seemingly controlled pressures. And this is a patient with thick corneas and a low hysteresis. So there's not necessarily a direct correlation. But despite that, over time, being followed by a glaucoma specialist in a clinical trial, you're still seeing a slow loss of nerve fiber layer and a corresponding visual field defect over time. Um, that would could have been predicted and anticipated um, with a patient, when you see a patient that has a low history, so it's like 8.6. Next slide. Uh, so this was really one of the first patients that I, uh, that, that kind of, this machine kind of rocked my world and changed what I, what I thought I understood about glaucoma. Uh, this was a 34 year old female of, uh, of Indian descent with no past medical history, no family history of glaucoma. She has thin corneas, normal tension um, as far as her blood pressure is concerned, um, low pressures, 10 by Goldman apination. She's on no meds, had an extensive neuroophthalmology workup. And this is, a, I love this picture you can see on the left eye, that classic wedge defect in the inferior notch that you see, next slide. Uh, and that corresponds with an OCT that also shows a corresponding loss of nerve fiber layer. And then you also like to correlate this with the visual field and you can see a progressive from 2006 to 2015 uh, focal central scotoma that corresponds with that nerve fiber layer loss. So, you know, this in my, pa in my, in my clinic, this patient is low tension glaucoma. And my, uh, my low tension glaucoma patients, based on the LOGITS study, the low tension glaucoma treatment study, uh, I put on uh, bromonidine twice a day. Uh, and so what happened? What did she do? So we see her right eye. Um, I, I didn't treat the right eye. The right eye was doing fine. And um, I saw her a couple months later and the right eye parameters haven't really changed. But she came in to see me with this finding and her pressures were 11 on Goldman apination. Hysteresis was low, 8.7. And IOPCC of 16.7. So I put her on bromonidine twice a day. Um, 
and she came back and her his, um, her Goldman apination is 10. So uh, really not a significant change. This is potentially a non-responder to Brumonity. So uh, what would the audience do right now? Would you guys continue the course, change things, operate? Um, what's your what's your general thought on this? Go ahead and vote everybody. Sixty <clears> percent <throat> so far saying they would add additional drops. Uh, about thirty-five percent saying continue to monitor. That's about how it's shaking out. Okay, good. And so this is what uh, what challenged my fundamental understanding of what I thought I knew about glaucoma is despite the fact that the Goldman apination checked by me did not significantly change, the ILPC decreased by over five millimeters of mercury. So something happened and Goldman missed it. For some reason, when the, IL, when the hysteresis is low, um, it's not that there wasn't a change, but I feel like when the hysteresis is low, Goldman apination is not an accurate measure of the true pressure. And for some reason, the IOPCC and the ORA instrument picked up a change that Goldman missed. Uh, so I didn't change anything. I kept the patient and now, but every time I see her, she is someone I get an IOPCC on every time. So here's a patient sent by one of my optometry colleagues uh, for a disc heme evaluation. No family history glaucoma, mildly myopic, average corneal thicknesses, pressures of 13 and 14 on Goldman, and uh, cup to disc ratios are, are suspicious for glaucoma. You can see the optic nerve images on the next slide. Uh, actually, sorry, not yet. Um, and um, he has a resolving disc heme on the right. And um, and then this is this is the printout I have on every one of my patients when I enter it. You can see the IOPCC in my in electronic macro, medical records was 16.7 and low hysteresis on the right. Uh, IOPCC 17.7, low hysteresis on the left. Discrepancy between Goldman and uh, and IOPCC. So next slide, please. And so here are the classic glaucoma optic nerves uh, with some parapapillary atrophy, and you see the corresponding loss uh, where the disc hemorrhage was on the right side. And then you do see some impaired contrast sensitivity in the right eye on visual field um, uh, that I think is real. Uh, so same thing. I saw him in June um, of 2016. I put him on Latanoprost. Came back and it was, didn't really change. It was 1314. I was 1312. In every drug study done by the FDA for a glaucoma, this patient would have been a non-responder to Latanoprost. So uh, the question is, what would we do? What should we do next? There's another what do we, audience poll. Yeah. Click surgery, on the vote. Change meds. It's pretty much evenly split right now, although, no, continue to monitor is leading the way at about 65% of the vote with 25% uh, to add additional drops. So a little okay. biased people would continue to monitor. Maybe, yeah. So uh, we continue to monitor, but not because the pressure didn't change, but because look what the IOPCC did. The IOPCC went from 16.7 down to 12 and 17.7 down to 12.6. So again, in a low hysteresis, and, and also, you know, did the did the corneal hysteresis increase? You know, it's a chicken and egg thing. I, I'm not sure. There's a natural variation a little bit uh, on what the CH can be, repeat, depending on repeated measures. We've changed the system a little bit, um, but you don't typically see someone cross the line from like an eight to a 12. But sometimes you can see it change just subtly, but still lower than average, uh, high risk. But this patient now, in my mind, responded to latanoprost. And the other thing, it challenges my whole understanding of, of the way drugs were studied in this uh, in all the FDA trials. Uh, so I wouldn't change anything, but this is another patient that I have labeled in the chart that he gets a IOPCC at every visit. Uh, so this patient uh, is also a courtesy of, of uh, Nate Radcliffe. Uh, this is a 55-year-old gentleman with follicular conjunctivitis, conjunctivitis and, uh, and periocular dermatitis, high pressures on Goldman, has a 10-year history of ocular hypertension. Uh, his baseline pressures are in the 30s, um, slightly above average, uh, thicker corneas. He's on latanoprost, a fixed combination, and um, and, um, and 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 Timolol, and, and he's, they've changed that around. But on that, his pressures have been in the in the low 20s, 22 to 25. His nerves are stable. Visual fields are stable. You've been following him for um, for 10 years, um, and he's having some top, topical problems with these drops. So um, what would you do next? Uh, would we just tell him to suck it up and stay on these drops? Uh, are you going to add even more drops, uh, change things up, or consider surgery? 
or stop everything. Well, it looks like so far leading the way is uh, consider surgical options, 52%, followed by discontinue therapy and monitor. What 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 happened here, Devinder? Yeah. Well, um, and this is what's exciting, hopefully, when we see more data on the OATS trial. So um, when you look at the actual numbers, the patient's uh, IOPCC was 28, and his history was 14. I think I only had one or two patients in the past uh, five years of using the machine that I've ever seen you know, with a history is that high. He's literally off the charts, um, off the charts good, and off the charts uh, uh, at lower risk of developing and progressing for glaucoma. So that in my clinic as well would give me confidence to tell the patient they're in a very low risk category. Um, let's start stopping some of this stuff. And so Nate stopped everything and followed the patient for the remaining four years and, and really has not seen a change at all. And that's powerful because especially in this day and age when we want to minimize the interaction with the healthcare system, my patients with a high hysteresis, I'm more likely to push them out for six months, do a telemedicine visit, say, yeah, I'll see you in six months. You have a hysteresis of 13, I'm not worried. Uh, and so it can allow me to better risk stratify my patients, especially in the setting of this pandemic where uh, you want to minimize the patient's interaction with the healthcare system. So I think without question, based on all the papers that uh, Dr. Madero's talked about, um, it's, it's shown um, quite uh, convincingly that hysteresis is an independent risk factor for glaucoma development and progression. And I consider it without question a glaucoma vital sign. And I will not make a clinical decision on my glaucoma patients without knowing their hysteresis. It's almost like walking into a room and not knowing the pressure um, or not knowing the nerve or not knowing the visual field status. Um, what I think is really important to remember is that when the hysteresis is low, when it matters, there's a greater discrepancy between IOPCC and Goldman apination. And Goldman apination invariably reads artificially low, in my opinion. Um, and I'm more likely to operate and intervene on a patient with a low hysteresis. Uh, the other thing is still, I, I still don't think the cornea is that important, uh, but I do think the biomechanics of the eye are. So uh, now let's talk about this puff test and, 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 and this crazy pandemic we're all battling right now. So, you know, uh, when you look back at the data that's come out of China and Asia on patients with PCR positive known COVID hospitalized, uh, they, they've, they've taken cultures of every bodily fluid possible, and, um, and very, very rarely are they able to ever actually isolate viral particles from uh, the tear film, and extremely rarely are they able to actually culture it. And if you look at a study out of, uh, out of NUS, which is the, in Singapore, uh, an affiliate of Duke, um, they took patients with known PCR-positive COVID and um, took tons of samples of their conjunctival swabs and tear film, and they were not able to isolate viral particles, nor were they able to culture the viral particles. So this, again, is showing us this is a lot different than what we thought we knew back in February and January and March when New York was getting rocked, uh, Italy was getting rocked, Asia was getting rocked. We know a lot more now. And what we know, which gives us, a, I think it gives me a lot of um, a lot of reassurance, is that the tear film is a very unlikely vector uh, for contagiousness uh, when it comes to COVID. And this is a study just hot off the presses, uh, September 2020 out of India in the Journal of Glaucoma. Uh, and they, what they wanted to do was they wanted that they took a very similar non-coctinometer with the same puff as the, his, as the uh, hysteresis instrument, the ORA, um, and and they 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 did all the gold standard imaging for just evaluating aerosolization of of particles of of tear film, and uh, they did it in a couple of different scenarios. One in a normal environment. Two, they put one drop of artificial tear in the eye, and three, they put two drops of artificial tear in the eye. And what they found was that in the normal environment, they did not see any generation of droplets form at all. They didn't leave the eye at all. After one installation, there was some evidence of some droplets on the patient's tear on the patient's eyelashes and cheek, but not outside the eye really or the orbit uh, after two drops where the eye was just pooling with uh, with fluid they did find that there were some small droplets emitted on the surface of the non-contact Um, but these droplets were all around 200 300 microns and when we think about aerosolization of particles and how long it takes for this to settle uh, based on size Really, when we get a little worried when it comes to about 50 microns or less. Uh, when it's about 100 microns, it really within five feet, it settles by five seconds. So this is, again, further proof that even in the extremely rare situation, you'd actually isolate any viral particles 
coronavirus, COVID-19 viral particles in the tumor foam, it'd be extremely hard to spread it or aerosolize it. And, uh, and this is someone with a known actively shedding virus. Um, so I think without question, when, when I approach my patients, especially early on, I wanted to minimize my interaction with the patient, minimize touching the patient, minimize my staff getting close, because we do know that you can spread it through the, you know, through air, airborne stuff when they're talking or coughing or being close to their face. Um, and uh, there's this one article that a lot of uh, people will point to without knowing a lot of the details of it back in 1991 by um, Britt et al. And it did show some theoretical aerosolization, even though there's still be pretty big particles, number one. And number two, it, it showed that um, this, the thing to keep in mind is that the power of that puff in this study from 1991 was four to six times more powerful than what the ORA instrument uh, puts out. Uh, what's also nice about this, uh, this, this ORA uh, instrument is that uh, the, the surface can be very easily wiped down. And this is kind of really points to the way I can be sure to provide the maximum safety for my patients and my staff is the level of interaction and the distance and the safety um, that they can be in, a, in when they're evaluating patients. So what's also nice is that it does not require any disposable instruments. It's not reusable or costly. I know in some VAs, they're required to, dis, uh, to throw away a, a tonometer every visit, which can get extremely costly. Um, and, uh, and they also don't have to touch the patient's face or touch, get close enough to, to do anything. It's really a non-contact uh, interaction. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, um, the other benefit of this, uh, of this pandemic is we get some great memes. And, uh, you know, although I'm not an expert on COVID, I, I do know this is the cure. Um, that is dating. I think the only people in my genre and, and T Dave Taylor's genre might, might find this funny. All the millennials are shaking their head. Um, Anyway, thank you for your time. This is my email address, my phone number. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. This is my glaucoma family. I call them my glaucoma emotional support group. Um, we trade horror stories at the end of the day. Um, but, uh, but I think this is uh, just a tremendous addition and to, uh, and to my ability to risk stratify my patients and to take better care of my patients, even pre-COVID, specifically post-COVID. So uh, Dave, thank you for making this happen. Felipe, it's always a pleasure uh, to have you here and to learn from you. And uh, thank you all for your time couple questions for you. Actually, quite a few coming in again here, but we won't be able to get to them all. Uh, Dr. Schultz asks uh, about your uh, uh, normal tension glaucoma uh, case study. Why, why do you use bromonidine over a prostaglandin associate, uh, uh, analog in, a, in an NTG patient? Yeah, so the, the low, it's called the LOGIT study. I think it stands for Low Tension Glaucoma Treatment Study. Um, they, they followed patients um, with, and provided the same IOP control and randomize them to um, bromonidine versus timolol. And uh, there was a suggestion, again, it's not proven, but there was less progression in the bromonidine group despite the, uh, compared to the timolol group despite equal pressures. So that, that, that was one of the first studies to show, and there was some idea of that, that this bromonidine and alpha agonists provide some level of neuro, neuro enhancement or neuroprotection, a lot of them, because we don't have a causation, we usually just describe it as an IOP independent effect. But I think that's real. And even if it's not, um, the fact that there are some studies that show that low tension glaucoma patients have a lower rate of progression when they're put on an alpha agonist as opposed to a beta blocker has, is enough to change my practice pattern uh, in these challenging patients. Dr. Panzer, who I believe is down the road from you, so to speak, in Houston, asks, um, that he he says he sees in his aura uh, measurements with his patients that the hysteresis goes up after treatment and wonders uh, if this is something you've observed as well and what do we think that means yeah and i think i think we talked a little bit about that before uh when um when Filippo was finishing up um you know it's kind of a chicken or an egg thing right um you can't um measure a system without altering a system. And 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 I would say, what, what's the true normal state of the eye? Is the true normal state of the eye when the pressure is 25 or the, the true normal state of the eye is when the pressure is 17? And and I, I the way I see it is I do expect the hysteresis to change just a little bit when the pressure is altered. Um, and I consider uh, when I have the patient at a pressure that I think is reasonable, that's what I consider their 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 baseline hysteresis measurement. When a patient comes in with a pressure of 30 um, and I get a hysteresis and it's seven, and then I, I treat them down to a pressure of 15 and their pressure their hysteresis is now 8.9, 
I don't consider the seven to be a real number. I think it's an artifact based on the fact that the eye is a little hot and, um, and it may not be the best reflection of the true properties of the biomechanics of the eye. When it's in a more normal and relaxed state, that's when I put a lot of weight on. But like I said, I, 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 although I do see it change a little bit, usually it does increase just a little bit. I don't usually ever see it cross the line of 10, you know, that magic number of in the 10 range of high is good, low is bad. Uh, I've never seen a patient with a high pressure and a hysteresis, say a pressure of 30 and a hysteresis of eight. When I get the pressure down to 15, I don't see them jump to the other side and, and go to a hysteresis of 11. Um, you know, they may go from an 8.7 to a 9.2 or something like that. Somebody asked if we could have a reference for the um, NCT paper from India. We'll send out that information afterwards. I believe it was Journal of Glaucoma, September, Dr. Shetty. Um, yeah. And somebody else asked if there's any comparisons between the ORA pressure measurement and the Falk uh, tonometer. Falk tonometer is an interesting new device, but Devinder, I, I don't know that you have any experience with it to make a, a correlation. Uh, I don't. I don't have any experience with the Falk tonometer, but I know um, I'm sure. I think I think we've talked about it before, Dave, and I think you you have some information about that. Always the case. Uh, there is more research that needs to be done. Uh, Dr. Davy asks, is there a calculator similar to the Oates calculator where we can add CH values? I, I would love if that were the case. I don't think one exists yet. Although no, we do know that the, um, I uh, think that Oates was thing. the thing. That was the thing we were most excited about with the 20-year Oates follow-up was right. uh, if. You know what? What Dave Taylor and the whole Riker team did was they gave a hist, uh, uh, an ORA instrument to every OATS site uh, for them to incorporate into their data for this perspective study of 20 perspective study of 20 years. And unfortunately, I think probably only what 10% of the sites actually took it out of the box and used it and uh, dusted it off. Or they all uh, they all used it, but they you know they measured a small percentage of patients. But I think it's enough patients to power the you know the analysis. So I'm expecting that to be published at some point in the near future. Yeah, and I think that's going to be extremely powerful. With even though the numbers were a little smaller than we we're hoping, uh, I think it's going to be extremely powerful. And 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 while it may not provide us with a nomogram, um, what's nice is when you have this this instrument, uh, you don't really need the nomogram. Uh, I think the the history of this number is much more powerful. So uh, now the, the last poll question here is after you're hearing all of this from our two great speakers tonight, um, um, how are you feeling about your knowledge of corneal hysteresis now? Go ahead and vote on that. And we've got uh, near 100% say they have a better understanding of the importance of corneal hysteresis now. So I think, I think we did our jobs, gentlemen. I think we... Uh, I think we helped everybody understand the parameter a little bit better. Just a few uh, closing thoughts here. That's what the device looks like in case you're curious. Uh, Reichert's been in the tonometry business for over 50 years, starting with the invention of the non-contact tonometer. Uh, we make Goldman tonometers. We are the manufacturer of the uh, world famous Tano Pen tonometers and also the Model 30 Numa tonometer. So very, very uh, uh, rich history. Uh, in tonometry. We, uh, our headquarters is in Buffalo, New York, where we engineer and assemble most of our products. And the ORA G3 shown here is still the only device that can measure corneal hysteresis and IOPCC. We have a wonderful staff of clinical application specialists that would uh, be happy to do a demonstration of this device for you. And these days, we can do that virtually. Um, so if you're interested in seeing what this thing looks like um, and, um, you know, uh, asking some questions and uh, watching it in operation, we can do that for you virtually or or in person through our, our global distribution network or maybe with the help of one of our own personal uh, clinical application specialists. So reach out to us. We'll be contacting you all via email after this webinar uh, so that we can stay in touch with each other because I know many of you will want to learn more. Uh, in summary, corneal hysteresis, I think we've uh, shown tonight is a powerful predictive factor for glaucoma development and progression. We, um, we would like to say that IOPCC is a new gold standard of tonometry, uh, but as Dr. Grover mentioned, I don't think Goldman's going away tomorrow, but we certainly would encourage you to add it to your arsenal. The ocular response analyzer G3 is safe and efficient for use during the COVID era, as Dr. Grover pointed out. Uh, and be sure to sign up for our next uh, Riker webinar. We have Dr. Singh coming up on October 29th. He's going to be talking about the Tano Pen and, um, and showing some studies on the Tano Pen and how he uses the Tano Pen, particularly during this uh, COVID era. So don't miss out on that one. Sure to be fun and exciting evening. 
Uh, I'm going to close the uh, webinar up right now. Anybody who asked a question that we didn't uh, answer, we will answer uh, via email follow-up. If I can't answer it, or I'll, I'll uh, delegate it to the uh, wonderful speakers we had here this evening. Please uh, take one extra minute when we close up shop here to take our webinar survey. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to seeing you at a trade show, hopefully next year. Thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us tonight. Take care.